morning. I'm, uh, as Dr. Cran mentioned, I'm Dale Sutter. I am the principal system architect in the office of the CTO at NVIDIA, which is a really, really long-winded way to say that I'm for the future. So my job is essentially to design and model the kind of accelerated systems that uh, we might be building five to seven years out. So you know, both for our fuses, things like the coral systems that the DOE announced uh, were, were monitored by, as well as kind of just sort of running, all right, five years now we build, five years now we build, and making sure that all the pieces exist so that it's not just a forklift that comes to your door, drops some hardware, wave goodbye, and drive your own. We want to make sure that these are uh, programmable and usable for the technical computing workloads of today and the future. So I'll start, uh, since this is the Ababish conference, I'll start by not talking about MPI. So the future is, is really large. Um, when people think of, of big computing, they tend to think of, of HPC. You know, things like uh, hydrodynamic simulation or aerodynamic simulation uh, or um, you know, various types of chemical modeling. Uh, things that are traditional kind of guy in white lab coats, scientific computing. But over the last decade, really a lot of large computing has been driven by other factors. You know, data intensive processing, big data, deep learning, uh, convolutional neural nets. Uh, in these cases, you have large amounts of data, but really the data isn't generated by the computer. The data is generated by you. The data is generated by what you search, what kind of pictures you post, what you say to your phone. Um, in those cases, really, we're the sensors. We're the data input. The computer systems are processing our data, not generating data for us. As kind of a, a scope of how, how large this is, uh, the internet grows by about 2.5 exabytes a day of web data. Walmart generates 2.5 petabytes of data every hour from customer transactions. Facebook posts about 350 million images a day. And YouTube, YouTube uploads 100 hours of video every minute. That's an immense amount of data. In fact, one of my favorite stories, actually not from this job, from a, from a previous job, is that uh, a large uh, retailer their security camera installs, while not done in every site, when they do do a site, they do about 250 cameras for a, a large warehouse type building. And the primary consumer of that data, and this is, goes back about a decade, the primary consumer of that data was not the security department, it's the marketing department. They process those images, and every time a hand goes up to pick something off the shelf, that is marked as a transaction and then they compare that data. If they move the radius to the left side of the blade, is that more or fewer picks per minute? So there's an immense amount of data. There's a lot of information there. How do we pick through that data and understand? Google's approach a few years ago was something called the Brain Project. Um, they were doing. Uh, Search for high-level features using what's called unsupervised learning. So they were trained a neural net without tag data. They were just feeding it lots and lots of imagery. And in fact, what they did was take 10 million individual frames off of YouTube and just fed it into the neural net and allowed it to train. Um, so you know, roughly 100, uh, a million epochs of data. Um, sped into a thousand servers for three days. What they got back was this. The neural network thinks that's important based on Google, uh, based on YouTube. 
So that's not something that was designed by uh, the people training it. That's just raw data fed in, let the neural net train itself, and came back with, I don't you know, as a, as a neural net. It doesn't know what this is, but it knows it's important. It shows up a lot. The other thing was cats. So if you're worried about Skynet coming for you, it's you or the cats. But this is unsupervised training. This is not take data. This is just we're feeding a lot of, of silver imagery through let the, the neural net determine what's important and what's not important. So shortly after that, remember this was done on a thousand CPU, a thousand servers with a total of 16,000 cores. Uh, the same group replicated that with accelerators. They used uh, three servers with four accelerators per server got the same performance. So that's, it. that's an enormous speed up in terms of both uh, capital investment, in terms of what the hardware costs, as well as in terms of, of power. And the nature of, of DNN, of, of deep neural networks, is they scale pretty well for accelerators. Obviously, they also scale pretty well for, for servers. You can use a thousand servers on the same problem. But you get very good speed ups uh, with accelerators. So, good in fact, that over the last uh, few years, the uh, image recognition challenge, um, the AlexNet challenge, is now dominated by accelerators. You know, in all three categories, the winning teams have been using accelerators. Uh, over, and this is actually almost two years old, but over 80% of the teams are using accelerators. I think in the last competition there was only one of the teams that, that did not use accelerators, and, and they instantly did not win. Uh, but accelerators uh, improve the performance of training so much that they, just, they make this practical rather than impractical. And so practical that it's engaged in by pretty much a who's who of, of research institutions, as well as a who's who of, of search and image processing and data processing organizations. If you're talking to your phone, it's very likely that at the back end that is going through a neural net that was trained on accelerators. So huge amounts of data, huge demand to process that data. How do we need that? Not surprisingly for people in HPC, power is the big challenge. If I was tasked with building an exascale system today, using technology that exists today, and I decided to forego accelerators and just grab the most efficient non-accelerated system I could, the, 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 take the top system on the green 500 um, that didn't use accelerators, you know, GPUs, eyes, FPGA is nothing, and just scale that up. And this is a naive scaling, I'm not actually trying to do my job, I'm just like multiplying. So linear extrapolation from that system to an exaflop, I wind up with about uh, a uh, gigawatt of power. So it's the combined power draw of the South Bay and San a gigawatt's a little bit more than most data centers have available to build a machine. So clearly, it's not practical to, to do things at this scale without accelerators. So what do we do? The problem has been we've been hitting a frequency wall. So 20 years ago, you had a single core, single socket system on your desktop, uh, with a workstation or a PC, your laptop. Um, though 20 years ago, the laptops were more about crushers than laptops. Um, and every year that got a little faster. And that really continued on right up till around the turn of the century. Um, in the good old days, a new process came along, so a new, fab a new fabrication process. And that allowed us to shrink the, the size of the transistors. So we, we would cut the size of the, of the <coughs> features in half. We'd get 4x the transistors and 8x the capability for the same column. 
Now that doesn't translate into something that's like 8x faster because you're using more transistors, you've got you know, other things in the system that aren't shrinking. Uh, but we get a really good speed up every 12 to 18 months in terms of delivered performance because most of that speed up came in terms of increased clock rate. So your existing app just got faster. If you're a scientist, don't worry. You learned Fortran 4 as a physicist. That's just good forever. That code you wrote as a grad student, that's, that is forever code. You're never going to have to change that. You're just going to get faster for it. Then the problem happens. The reality for about the last 15 years is we still get lithography improvements. We still get smaller features. But because we're threshold voltage, voltage limited, we get 4x the transistors. And we can get 8x the capability, but due to leakage and some factors, it costs us 4x the power. Or um, we can get about 2x the performance uh, in a small area, but in ISO power. So we're still able to make things smaller. We still have a bigger transistor budget to work with, but we don't get this free power budget to work with. So, Increasingly, the performance improvements you get are, are not fab related in that they're not just free clock cycles that you can run faster. It's performance related in that it gives designers, chip designers, whether that's NVIDIA or Intel or somebody else, more transistors to work with, but really not very much power efficiency. The power bump we get. At any, at any feature range, leaving the entire semiconductor industry is maybe sometimes 20%. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a doubling of power efficiency every time. Uh, this kind of just restates what I just said. You can see that, that uh, starting around the middle of the 90s, we started to get leakage uh, exploding. We can combat that by dropping the frequencies so we can use transistors that are a little bit slower to switch that sacrifices some amount of frequency uh, and we get much lower leakage but of course that's going in the opposite direction that you were getting 20 years ago where our generation of transistors got faster. Now we want transistors to get a little bit slower because that gives us more power budget to work with. So summarizing that um, you can see starting, you know, just after, you know, around 2005 and through 2010, our transistor budget was still up and to the right. So transistor is not a problem. Single thread performance kind of capped out. That's not surprising because we ran out of, we ran out of uh, clock speed increases. The clock speed increase is capped out, thus the, the bar above it. The wattage capped out, that's really a factor of cooling and, and, and other form factors. And we can always like, run things hotter. Um, but there's limits there. You don't necessarily want your machines to glow orange in machine room. So what we're left with, since we can't really, you know, our, our power budget is more or less fixed in, in form factors. Uh, if you're going to be air-cooled, that's around 50 kVA for a rack beyond um, 50,000 watts. It's really hard to air cool. You can go to direct liquid cooling and some other technologies, uh, but you still have some limits there in how tight you can pack hot things together. Uh, we can't, as I mentioned, increase the frequency anymore. Uh, we don't get magically better performance by increasing the frequency. So what we're left with is parallelism, number of things. And that's okay because you know we got more transistors to work with, so we can scale these things out uh, and give you guys more performance. Famous quote from uh, a fairly well-known designer from Chip Falls: uh, If you want to plow a field, do you want four strong oxen or or uh, a cave of chickens? And the answer is really we, we want to have both of them. The model that NVIDIA has been pursuing for uh, almost a decade now has been optimizing parallel and serial execution. So building tightly coupled heterogeneous architectures where we have a CPU with some very latency optimized cores. So they're, they're designed to run things at as high clock as, as we can provide. And they provide really good single-threaded performance. They're good at things like you know, 
branch prediction and pointer chasing and a bunch of other things. Uh, and a GPU or an accelerator that does the majority of the parallel work. The GPU is optimized for throughput. So we, we build a, both a processor and a memory system that, that sacrifices latency in order to get through. We can process more operations in parallel because we're a SIMP uh, system that's very latency tolerant. Uh, and we just have the, the latency important operations run on the CPU that's latency optimized, but you know, as a result, really can't service the same kind of bandwidth. And that whole heterogeneous this architecture provides a way to kind of get the best of both worlds. You can have two physical not two physical memory systems, each with their own optimization points. We can have two processors designed each with their own optimization points. The combination of those uh, lets us run you know, existing modes that have uh, large parallel components in a way that, that you know, doesn't sacrifice the parallel performance for the serial performance of the core OS. Uh, so if you look at Anvil's law, if you start with an app that has, has no offload, you're getting essentially the same performance that you get on a CPU, because you're running it all on the CPU. And then as you push work uh, to the CPU, you get a normal kind of Anvil's law speed. You move stuff from the CPU to the GPU, where you have more parallel performance, uh, it just gets faster. So this was all great, and I've kept you entertained for, oh gosh, like almost half an hour, or semi-entertained. But last I checked, this was an advantage and probably won't make that same message passing. So, Accelerators and message passing is not a new conversation. Here's the, uh, this one's a little over four years old uh, talk I gave for the Open Fabrics Alliance. I actually have one that's older than but I couldn't find it, probably because it's embarrassing. Um, so we've been thinking about this and, and working with MPI teams, especially Dr. Banna, for a number of years now on making accelerators play better with, with message passing systems. So the problem circa 2008, 2009 when I came on board was that, you know, you recall a few slides back where I showed this heterogeneous architecture where we had two different processors, each with its own tuned memory system. Uh, and in 2000, 2009, those were very, very distinct memory systems. So you had two processors that were fast in their own, you know, each in their own realm in serial and parallel, um, but they were connected by this PCI Express straw. And when you added something like a like a NIC, you now have three entities that were only weakly connected. Um, GPUs really like to have hidden memory. We have transfer engines on our hardware. So most of what like, people commonly think as a GPU is like, oh, it's just a tape drive that does math. It sits out on the PCI Express bus, and the CPU throws stuff at it, and it gets processed. And in reality, it's kind of the reverse of that. That the GPU sits out on the PCI Express or a link bus, that's true. But most of the data movement is being initiated from the, from the GPU, not from the CPU. So the GPU wants in memory spaces for its own memory, and it handles the transfers back and forth. Um, InfiniBand actually works in a very similar fashion. The InfiniBand card is doing you know, RDMA, so it's doing DMA locally. The card of the PCI Express bus wants to the bus master a transfer and pull things out of, out of post memory. So the InfiniBand card also wants in memory. The challenge was that neither of these two systems played well with each other. So the way that the GPU was paying memory was completely opaque to the, to the ID card. The ID uh, HGA didn't know anything. Could get its own memory through its driver. But the GPU didn't know that. So you ended up having multiple pinned buffers you had to copy between on the host side 
just to move between two devices that were both sitting on the Visa Express bus, and we were both capable of a bus master transfer, and that just seemed so. You have three copies of the data sitting around, you had now hosted intervention. Um, it, it really, you know, even from a, from a quick view, it did not look like something that was well architected. So around 2009, uh, NVIDIA started on something called GPU Direct. And GPU Direct is really a family of technologies. Um, it's a long-term effort by NVIDIA to more tightly integrate accelerators with networks. So it's not something that's tied to specific hardware. Um, Certainly, there's, there's a great implementation by Mellanox with great support from Vapish. Um, but it's not solely a Mellanox and Vapish um, technology, although, as a quick advertisement, both those entities are usually like first off the door with their solutions. Um, it does not uh, tie to specific middleware or programming APIs. The low level features really could be used by by things other than MPI. And in fact, we have in some realms, we have users that are tying it in directly from user code. Um, but in general, again, the first group out the door is, is Mellanox and, and Advantage. And that's really because they have you know, a large user community that's very hungry for those type of phones. So version one of GPU Direct was quite modest. Um, we really focused on memory paying and getting that coordination down. So it was, in essence, a way for uh, the, the GPU and CPU software to agree that this region of memory on the host was pinned and we can both uh, DNA out of it. So it didn't do any message passing in the normal sense. It just allowed two different pieces of hardware on, on PCI to share a pin buffer in the host. So that, you know, eliminated a host side copy, uh, allowed kind of the software to start, and more importantly, it kind of for us paved the way and gave us a direction for future improvements in both our driver uh, and software stacks. And in fact, um, the GPDR version one was the was the basis of, of unified virtual addressing. Uh, and then unified memory. Unified virtual addressing was essentially putting the GPU and CPU memory all in the same uh, virtual address space. So the pointers became unique. The pointer only dereferenced to either GPU or CPU memory. That started to allow MPI implementations and other software implementations to introspect that pointer and decide what physical memory space uh, messages or copies were going to. And it also provided a basis for unified memory, which I'll talk about for other slide. GP Direct 2 was, was where we introduced the first thing that started to look like messaging. Uh, we introduced peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. So with GP Direct 2, we had um, both direct access uh, and direct copy. Direct access would be two GPUs on the same PCI Express complex. Uh, if one of them dereferences a pointer that pointed into the other GPU's memory, which remember we could detect because we have a single virtual address space that covers all those memories, uh, the GPU would just initiate a bus master transaction and grab that value directly. There was no need to, to do a separate copy or fault up to a separate code path. It just goes and grabs it out of the, the other uh, processing memory. We also introduced direct transfers. We built to do copies directly between uh, GPUs on the same PCI Express bus uh, without having to bounce off from the host side. The later feature, um, that direct copy, was quickly leveraged by MPI implementations uh, as a message delivery path. So your MPI implementation could recognize that you were sending a message to a, to a memory space it was really on the same PCI Express bus, and rather than you know going to a Shem Arena host or you know something strange like a loopback uh, in the network space, it could just harness this pathway directly uh, and and move the data over to the PCI Express bus uh, without having to go out to for a
virtual UVA, unified virtual addressing, later grew into what we call unified memory. So the developer view before unified memory was host and device memories were separating and you had to copy between them, whether that was an, uh, you know, done via UVA or done by the old method with the pointers. With uh, unified memory, the developer view is really now one memory space. You can still do explicit copies um, that have been available really since, since 2 v one uh, but you can now, with GPUs, do implicit data, implicit copies. So you can essentially allocate uh, memory on the host with the current version of CUDA. It's an opt-in allocator. But anything you allocate with that moves as necessary to the GPU um, when, you, when you launch a current. So prior to kernel launch, the data gets moved over. Anything that's touched on the host side afterwards gets moved back. Additionally, we've, we've expanded on the peer-to-peer -peer features, and we have what's called GPU Direct RDMA. GPU Direct RDMA exposes the same GPU memory um, to the NIC or other device, and it allows the drivers for the NIC to push into the GPU vector. In this case, it's not, you know, we're providing a facility for others to push and pull data out of our memory, uh, but it's not using our transfer engines. So I didn't list it as a feature we have, but it's safe to say it's well harnessed by MPI implementations as a way to do message delivery directly into the accelerator mode. No bones buffering on the host, just push data directly from NIC into the accelerator. So we now kind of have, you know, the underpinnings for making GPUs and accelerators in general better MPI citizens, as I put it five years ago. Um, how does that now translate with the first half of this discussion, where I talked about, you know, the, really the big data and, and enterprise level computing needs, you know, that are at such a scale that, that you're never going to build a workstation or a new system large enough to process them. So, I'll start with a little bit of CEO math. Um, exascale tends to be the focus. I think at least two or three of us have exascale in our, in our talk title um, because it's trendy. So, recalling what, I, what we talked about uh, with processor speeds. If you're looking at Exascale machine early next decade, which several governments are, you're probably going to get a processor with a speed of around a gigahertz. I'm just going to use a very round number. Maybe it'll be 1.2 gigahertz. So don't like run out here going, the video guy said they're only going to build gigahertz. AMD came in, they said 1.2 gigahertz. So AMD is like, we're just going to use a round number. It's going to be a gigahertz. I guarantee it won't be 10 gigahertz. All of that. And it probably won't be 100 megahertz. So we'll just say it's a gigahertz. If you run out that math, if you're just going to take that processor, your gigahertz processor, and scale that out to get to an exaflop, um, that's billion way parallelism by itself. So I'm not differentiating, you know, Message passing from threads, just a billion something across messages, threads, and factors. Given what we know about memory systems, even stacked memory systems, let's just add a factor of 10 to that because we're probably going to want you. We're probably going to want you to do some level of, of symmetric multi-threading uh, in order to hide latency in our memory system, whether it's a it's a CPU or a GPU. So now you're at 10 billion way parallelism to get to access here. That's a significant amount of parallelism. That's, that's way more parallelism than anybody's gotten with flat guy. That's way more parallelism than anybody's gotten with PS. Way more parallelism than anybody's gotten with the old thing. So it's likely going to be some combination of both you know, unknown parallelism, thread level parallelism vectors, 
and mass capacity for, for the gas hurdles in between nodes to get to that. And there are a lot of good approaches in, in all those realms, and there's a lot of work going on in gas and gas, and it's like agent, uh, what we shown. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things happening in MPI and MPI plus X, including things like MPI plus MPI, where the lower level is also MPI. Um, but you're going to need, for an extra scale level performance, you're going to need a combined level of parallelism of about 10 billion way of uh, So open MP on threads equal 4 is probably not going to cut it for you. At this scale, this is not just a hardware problem. Certainly, we need to build hardware, but there's, you know, if, if your application is Fortran 4, it's you know, written in dusty deck code with maybe some open MP directives that you can go to non threads for. That code is not destined for success at Exascan. It's also not just a software problem. Um, even with the most optimistic fat note designs, you know, we're in the, the tens, the high tens of thousands to the low hundreds of thousands of nodes, and that's with very fat. You know, very capable nodes. Um, so order, you know, 10 to 100 teraflops per node. If you're going the thin node route, you know, uh, blue team self-hosted small chip, you're now in the many hundreds of thousands to a million nodes. And it's both those realms have proven pretty hard to scale. Numbers. Not impossible, uh, but it. it you run into some problems at that scale and you just don't run into the small scales. So there are a couple swim lanes for us to get there with hardware, but none of these swim lanes is, is obstacle free. There are, there are difficulties in making a 100 teraflop node. There are difficulties in making a million terminal network. And maybe most importantly uh, for this room is that, that some of these other drivers that I talked about are looking at machines of these scales, but they are looking at very different design points than you guys are. So while there are great technologies coming along, there are also going to be challenges in that, you know, to be honest, HPC by itself has not been proven to be a large enough market to keep any OEM alive as example by the number of HPC OEMs that lie dead beside the road in the last second. So HPC is most successful, has been most successful when it's leveraging ecosystems that, that exist for other reasons. So you, know, you, you typically have servers, uh, mobile, and accelerators. All three of those ecosystems have other ways to pay the bills. So the more you can tap into to those ecosystems, the better off you are. Um, the, the sad news is nobody's going to make you an HPC specific chip because that's the quick way to, to go with this. But they will make a chip that's good for other things and, and HPC. So we're all according to Dale. And as an aside, um, this slide appears to be my single largest contribution to NVIDIA, which is sad. Because there's about 80 different versions of it floating around in various VPs that were ripped off. So I guess I probably should have just retired after this and moved on. Uh, but our, our vision, our really our generic node model for the future is three parts. You've got uh, and you still have a, a CPU a latency optimized processor that's got some number of cores, it's got deep caches. Um, the whole memory system, the memory controller is tuned for, for low latency. Um, so we call those locks and it's got nice cores. You have a GPU or an accelerator, TOX, throughput optimized cores. Um, that's got memory that's optimized for bandwidth, usually at the expense of latency, so typically, you know, in the future that's stacked memory. Um, you'll have caches, but they're usually very, very small caches. You have a fairly significant 
uh, network on chip system to tie all the parallel units together. Um, and you've got an NIC, something that talks to the outside world. And you know, in the future, that's scalable to at least 100,000 nodes if you're going to that uh, node design. If you're going to big nodes, that's you know, scalable over a million nodes. And our model is you take those three building blocks and you tie those together with fabric. And by fabric, I don't mean you know, just a peripheral interconnect. I mean something that unifies these memory systems so that, for instance, the late optimized cores can either access their own memory or the stacked memory on the throughput optimized cores. So you have equal access to both, to, to both memory spaces. So you really have one memory system, uh, even though it's got two kinds of physically distinct memories that are tuned for, for different design points. The nice thing about that vision, that, that taking these building blocks and tying them together with fabric, is that it's really a direct evolution of the programming model that we have today that's proven to accelerate things on over 300 different HPC apps of why. Um, so we retain the specialized cores for parallel and serial work. Um, we provide a coherent memory system that has, you know, uh, latency optimized memory, throughput optimized memory, and likely in this time frame, uh, non-volatile memory. Um, make sure that everything has everything, you know, CPU, GPU, and network have equal access to all the memory spaces. We can then, um, back to what I said a few minutes ago, we can amortize away some of the non-parallel costs. So, you know, in HPC, where there's a little bit more serial workload requirements, we can change the ratio of blocks to talks compared to something like deep learning, where, you know, they really don't care how many blocks there are because they just need one to, to run the OS and everything is running parallel after that. Um, we, can, we can change that balance a couple ways. We can change the actual um, ratio of, you know, blocks to talks or we can use a cut down block. We can either have multiple GPUs attached to one CPU, or we can have one GPU with a much smaller CPU if you want the, the speed ratio. Uh, and this design, you know, once you've got kind of the, the, the programming model in place, which we do, and the building blocks, our building blocks in place, which we, we you know, have some of them and have the rest of them put uh, here, you can implement this really in, in several different ways. So as in, you know, our, our building block for this is something called NVLink. NVLink is a high-speed interconnect. It's essentially a way to tie memory systems together. So you know, up until now, we've attached via PCI or PCI Express. So you have a, have a GPU and a CPU tied together with this peripheral interconnect. We'll continue to do that. Um, you know, we, we do it today on x86, on, on Open Power, and on ARM64. Next year, we'll be doing it on x86, Open so Power, and ARM64. We'll continue all in the future doing that because it actually meets the needs of a large part of the market, um, both in the consumer space for you know, gaming and graphics, as well as actually uh, some of the technical computing spaces, for instance, uh, oil and gas, seismic imaging. They are so parallel that they can completely hide the transfer time between host and device, so they don't actually need anything faster than, than PCI Express. But starting next year, you'll also be able to buy uh, designs based on the open power uh, architecture that attach the processors directly to the NVLink. So you'll have NVLink between the open power system and between uh, the GPU. And we actually expect some other uh, CPU designs in the future to use that. We won't mention names. We're going to work with other CPU manufacturers to add that same kind of cash. And really, what that gives you is flexibility and integration. Uh, you know, so today, you know, in, in 2016, when you integrate things, it's off package. It's multiple sockets. So whether that's an NVLink link connection or even a piece of express connection, you have have two different sockets. Uh, in the future, we can also do that on package. We can use cut down, cut down CPU. We can use a silicon interposer and put the GPU and the CPU under the same 
heat shield, even though they're separate chips. So it would look as if it's a single chip, uh, but in reality, it's, it's two separate chips on, on intervals. Or we can integrate it on die. We can put the self-mass cores directly on the GPU die and, and provide a single chip solution. The nice thing about those is that's really an engineering decision. There are trade-offs either way. The quick way I usually say this is, you know, this one requires a new motherboard, which in dollars means somebody spent maybe a million dollars worth of engineering time to do a motherboard. Uh, the middle one, the unpackaged, meant that they had to do a silicon interposer and they have to have, you know, the integration happens earlier in the cycle to have the interposer built, so there's some tiny constraints on the CPU and GPU. Um, so that one costs you tens to maybe a hundred million, depending on how you did it. And the on die is, is a million dollars. That's what it costs, give or take, to do, do a chip design. So what that means to you guys, since it's not, I mean, it's eventually your money, right? It's somebody else's money to do the design, is that you can probably afford to build several of these. Um, every, every OEM can, can have their own design. Um, you can probably only afford to design one or two of the unpackaged things. And the on die, you get one. So you get to you get the number of latency optimized scores, the number of throughput optimized scores that somebody decided a couple of years ahead of time. And that's just being there. You can't do multiple multiple iterations of that. Um, the great thing is that um, while there are these huge trade-offs, from your side it doesn't matter because the programming model is the same. If you're doing MPI plus X, it's still the same MPI plus X no matter which of these is actually going to go. Most programmers don't go in the machine. Right? This is really just a how are things packaged inside the page box, not how do you program it. The next part is also lets you do some workload scaling things. So you know, different solution areas want different ratios of parallel to serial. Um, so you can use PCI Express switching to kind of fan out um, the connections on the CPU to multiple GPUs. What NVLink provides is a way to tightly unify all those, those high bandwidth memory systems. Um, and again, you can, you can do multiple iterations of this. So different OEMs can build differentiated products for different markets using kind of the same building blocks. So it's, it's something where it's, you know, the technology is paid for several times over because it can be used in different ways. It's not just a single design point that's out for the Again, since we're here to talk about um, MPI, you know, all this is great. I've talked about a bunch of ways that we can scale the node. But you still need to scale the node count. Uh, we work with multiple vendors. So I think we work you know, far and away tightest with, with Melanox. Um, but as I said earlier, when we try to maintain some, some agnosticism in our designs so that we're not tied to a single technology. Um, I also mentioned future networks will need to scale to over 100,000 nodes. What, you know, from my viewpoint in the future, what I see five years from now is, is likely multiple vendors. So both the ones you know and love as well as, as, as other vendors. Um, the good news is that they're more than likely based on some common technologies. So you know, more or less everybody starts with the same 30s, whether you're building Ethernet or InfiniBand. Uh, so most of these uh, vendors are kind of converging to similar 30s and similar cables. And, and really putting the engineering work to differentiate. Likewise, they're they're mostly converging down to to some similar middleware layers and, and even below MPI. You know, a few years back, everybody had their own. Um, you know, Cray had their own uh, uh, API API for their network. You had Verbs. Uh, you had. Um, uh, other infinite bands, message layers, you had um, portals, although not very often, thankfully. Uh, 
you had a, you had a bunch of different middleware technologies, things, you know, efforts like the fabrics and uh, the and some of the others. It seems to be cooking down with some common middleware layers that make implementing the, the higher layers of the stack a lot easier. Most of the networks seem to be evolving towards, you know, either put in our DNA or in some cases even directly load store uh, architectures. And it most seem to be evolving away from flat technologies. So or So it used to be that that you know, and actually kind of still is in the top, most of the top 100, that everything was a folded glow factory. So there was, you know, the cost of messaging to a near neighbor was roughly the same as the cost to messaging on the other side of the system. And the exceptions were a few machines that were, you know, either high dimensionality courses or, or, you know, some other other configuration. Most of the networks now seem to be kind of migrating towards or straight and There's a few that are, that are also considering high dimensionality courses, uh, but at scale, um, it, it kind of looks like the future for large scale is still is still very flat. You know, there are some cases that coral is a is a good you know counter example to that, where the the coral system, the, the Summit Sierra systems, will actually use NLS folded club. So they'll be very flat in terms of networking. Uh, but that's kind of the exception, I think, the rule at scale. You know, 2020, I expect the node counts to just be high enough that in most cases they'll they use things like dragonfly topology, which sacrifices some level of flatness to get scalability. So in those cases, there is a lower cost uh, for messaging close to you rather than messaging far away. So the end result of all these technologies of you know things like uh, NB Link, of, of fatter nodes, of you know very slight topologies are going to be systems that will leverage data locality. They'll leverage you know the fact that most of the time you're communicating to things that are close to you to get better efficiency, but the cost is going to be flatness. So you know you're, you're you're never going to get to, you know, back to the large shared memory systems where there was really kind of one memory controller with lots of processors hanging off that memory system. That you know, the way forward is really more types of memory, less flat networks, um, and leveraging those efficiencies, uh, those locality efficiencies, uh, to, to scale up. Finally, where does that leave you guys as, as an Apache users and API users? So, in the age of you know gas and PS capable networks and NV link nodes that have variable numbers of accelerators and things, MPI still plays a critical role for HTC. Many critical roles. First and foremost, it provides users with single messaging API that's, that's fabric agnostic. So, it's MPI sent. You don't have to know whether that happens via, God forbid, TCPIP or verbs or a Shem Arena or NVLink or Trustmaster or, or all various things that happen. They can just do a send and receive the messages delivered. So, they, they don't have to know about the underlying fabrics, and they don't have to change their code every generation <coughs> when a new fabric or new data back comes along. Second thing it does is it decouples the, the messaging granularity from, from the node design. So I talked a little bit about kind of the two swim lanes, kind of a fat node or a thin node to get to that scale, and you can use either of those. The challenge is you don't necessarily want that to translate into all codes. So if you use a, a fat node that has, let's say, a dozen accelerators in it and a couple sockets of, of CPU, you don't need that to be a single um, MPI rank. You could have multiple MPI ranks on there. And that kind of decouples your, your parallel decomposition from the design of the system. 
And PI works just fine on, on shared memory and, and new systems, even though you could be using something else. Uh, so it provides a, 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 a valuable way to, to decompose your problem really without having you know, a priority to decide how big the machine is. And finally, you know, MPI provides, and in fact, this is really kind of the poster child of this, it provides a great example of, of both simplifying things and improving performance because it's perfectly positioned to use some better heuristics to decide how much are, which is part of the, you know, I didn't even go into depth, but in a lot of these uh, technologies, there are even differences between a send and a receive pathways. So in some cases, a, a read is faster by one pathway and a write is faster by the other pathway. All those things can be incorporated into an in MPI, in fact, as a message passing layer. And that frees the programmers who, let's face it, are, some, are oftentimes domain scientists to not have to know or worry about that. They just have to decompose their problem correctly, um, and that part of and they allow the MPI system to use the, the best we ever have. And Backfish has been doing those things for you know as long as I probably goes back five years at SC where we had some random conversation. Oh, and Backfish has been doing those things for for better than. Five years on accelerators, and much longer now without accelerators. We're expecting a batch to keep doing that for us. Change the thought process at NVIDIA for building the XSK system. And if it has not, um, are we at the risk of building an XSK system which will not achieve XF law on any realistic application? So I, I missed the first part. I heard HPC, so I have to the gradient Correct. versus inverse was HPL. Yes. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit out of my bailiwick because I don't determine which one is more popular. Um, we actually have, and there's a great talk by uh, uh, some folks from Livermore, and unfortunately I forgot who gave the talk and what it's called, but if you search for HPCG benchmark, the High Performance Country benchmark, Livermore guys actually did kind of spider plots of, of Hollows track with machine properties, and the short answer is, um, right now it's kind of difficult to say whether HPL or HPCG provides a more realistic or more <coughs> accurate um, benchmark for how real-world codes will perform. Uh, it turns out, you know, it, uh, HPL tends to be very flops limited. Um, so your performance in HPL is tightly tied uh, to your DGM performance, your linear algebra performance, uh, which you know we're we're okay with because we're you know at some level we are a tape drive that does linear algebra. Um, we have a, we have a strong day job and a strong demand for products that do the near algebra. Uh, HPCG tracks almost exactly with streams, not even streams, triad. Um, so it tends to be strictly a memory, you know, it's, it, despite the intent, it tends to be just like what is your memory bandwidth. Um, that's also okay with us because it turns out that our day job requires extreme amounts of memory bandwidth, which is why we're a safety architecture to begin with and why we're willing to sacrifice like C for, for bandwidth. Uh, so we, you know, we like both those those benchmarks because they perform, you know, like our, our day job already positions us well to perform 
you know, very well on them in terms of performance. But, and now you get the role of the printing of the deal, I think both of them fall down a little bit as, as an analog for what real-world apps performance is. And you can, you know, you can easily verify that by, you can, you can go to top 500 or green 500 and, and look at where the systems fall and then go try to find like the science that has fallen, that has come out of those systems. And in a lot of cases, you know, the the HPL score, the HPCG scores, well important and a great marketing tool, um, ultimately are not really reflective of, of customer experience. That you know the Oil and gas, which is a large market for us, really could care less about either of them. Um, deep learning, which is a large market for us, could really care less about either of them. Because uh, they, in some cases, have applications that outperform either of those benchmarks um, due to factors that benchmarks don't capture. Um, if you want my, my two cents, I think one of the important things that's not really captured by either of them are things like the F ratios. So, You've got some amount of flops and some amount of memory bandwidth. It's pretty easy to design a system that has a ton of one of those and not enough of the other to support real-world computation. Um, you know, it, it, I think one thing that was kind of telling in previous generations is, is our competition could boast of higher bandwidth, sometimes you know, wider memory systems as well. But was actually slower than our product when doing something even as simple as like streams triad. So even introducing a little bit of, comp of computation into the memory bandwidth test caused things to fall over, and that to me is indicative of, of poor balance. So you know the market's going to determine which one of those is really going to be important, and there's always a there's got to be some measurement because a lot of people want to measure all the system is for grading rights. Um, but I will know that the, the blue water system shows not to ever benchmark their system or the system of the top 500. Or they benchmark it but they didn't submit to the top 500. But it's a challenge. Um, we're, we tend to engineer, we have markets where we, you know, we, we do a, a lot of performance simulation, we do a lot of sort of level simulation. Um, we tend to ship A01 or A02 silicon. So and we're very invested in making sure we design our architecture to get performance uh, on the application workloads, which, which we actually do. And if that also means we get great HPL or HPCG, then wonderful, but we don't really design for these. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> um, so some computations uh, run better on traditional CPUs. Uh, some computations run better on traditional CPUs, some on uh, NVIDIA. Um, is there a possibility of using a uh, uh, high low latency to connect like embedded band between the CPU and the embedded band GPU directly when they're separate boxes? Um, we're, so the question was whether you can tie the latency optimized and throughput optimized cores by a low latency interconnect like thin band. So instead of today, if you buy a system, it's PCI between them. In the future, it might be PCI or NVLink. Is there a possibility for, for another network? Um, in the search space, so in deep learning, they're doing designs like that. Uh, it's not quite as simple as, you know, hey, PCI is a DNA fabric and InfiniBand is an R DNA fabric. So they both have DNA, DNA in them, so can I just like get an adapter at Best Buy and make this work? Um, it's not quite that simple because remember that I said that we're the ones that are doing the, the, the pulls. So our transfer engines are responsible for plugging things in and out of the GPU. So you can't just plug in uh, InfiniBand, but there are designs that are looking at what we refer to as rack scale designs. So you have multiple nodes, 
multiple accelerators and processors, and you're kind of tying those together at the rack level, even though there's multiple nodes, there's some tighter connectivity. Um, so we're looking at those type of designs. I'm a little skeptical that that makes sense for HPC um, because you know there's there's always locality costs, right? And putting infinite band between two things makes them far apart, even if they're physically close together. Right? That's a, it's a slower uh, path than something like like. It's slower, but at least it's uh, lower latency. Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, it's not low latency than anything, but yeah. Um, so we're we're looking at things like that, but you know, I don't think you'll ever see like a here's a thousand nodes of CPU. On the other side of the system, I have a thousand nodes of GPUs, and I just have networks uh, between them. Um, I, I don't think you'll see that design. I think you will see in, in the coming years, you know, we're, we're doing a bunch of interesting things with NB Link that I can't talk about. Um, and you'll see some of them in the coming years, but I, I don't think you'll see the completely, you know, disaggregated version. You'll see some level of disaggregation, but not, you know, the GPU is, is in a data center or something like this. Thank you. Okay, so let's back again. Uh, yeah.